What you don't understand about the China versus the US pending war. Now, there is a lot going on in this global game of risk or global game of Game of Thrones, if you will. Who are the players at the board and what are their motivations? And where does China and the United States fit in? Well, I am sitting down today with Director of Intelligence, a National Security Fellow, somebody who gets this and we are going to dive deep into understanding what the techno-industrial war really is. We're going to talk about the three different layers of the technical industrial war. We're going to talk about the three sides of the triangle of how the world is really divided. We're going to talk about the China versus United States situation. What are the potential probabilities? What are the risks? And then, of course, we're going to ask him, what does he think is most probable to happen over the next couple of years? and the rest of this decade, not just with potential war, but potential supply chain disruptions, potential uh, dollar homogeny, US dollar reserve status, and inflation. We're gonna cover all this more. It was an amazing conversation with Matthew Pines, one you don't wanna miss. Let's just go ahead and just jump right into it. All right, Matthew Pines, Director of Intelligence at Krebs Stamos, so a National Security Fellow, um, you're pretty tied in on the kind of global techno-industrial war that's going on, a term that you've kind of used, geopolitical, cyber, all that. Um, so, man, there's so much we can jo jump in today. I'm excited to have you. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, you know, I know we had some conversations offline kind of talking about this kind of global Game of Thrones. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, a game my parents played was this game of Risk, which was like this board game, you know. Uh, and, if, and if you think about it like that, we're sort of seeing that where, you know, something I've been talking about is this decentralized revolution. Now, the world had been moving towards this globalism and kind of one world government, you know, um, centralized world. And now it seems to be kind of breaking apart back into whatever you want to call it, multipolar world, whatever. And, it, and, that, and that seems like there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, interest, a lot of things going on there. You kind of framed it up in this uh, techno-industrial war. I think you kind of said there's a lot of air arenas inside of that. So why don't you just frame mm -hmm. that up for us first? Yes, I mean, at the, at the level of great powers, great power competition, which is the era that we're in, like competition is over what are the instruments that modern states rely on to accrue and project power. And in the modern sort of technologically driven civilization, that's pre basically predicated on controlling capital flows, controlling supply chains, and controlling um, the most advanced technologies and the networks that the world system runs on, right? So the world is, is now awash in networks, networks for finance, right? Banking networks, networks for data, like the internet, uh, that often, you know, banking transactions go over as well. Networks of supply chains, trade relationships, military alliances. And so network power is sort of what people are competing over. And the dominant networks that determine who is going to win or lose in those competition is who has sort of the, tr the choke point and surveillance control over those networks. And that, that is a sort of an almost an all or nothing game, right? And so the United States has been in a position post-war of building a globalized system where it had the dominant um, um, role in those networks. It had the key nodes or it had um, alliance networks that give it access to those key nodes, whether it's surveillance over the global internet, whether it's influence over global trade policy, whether it's controlling of global shipping lanes. And that's the world system that we think about kind of the hegemonic sort of unipolar era. It's sort of defined by the United States control over these critical networks. And so China has, you know, embarked on a strategic effort of the past 20 you know, plus years to either displace those networks or to complete uh, and, and replace it with their own or try to co-opt and take over uh, U.S.'s or the G7's uh, sort of legacy position in controlling the existing networks. That's like the macro frame for the competition we see. And you can sort of chunk that into kind of the financial dimension, the technology dimension, the military dimension, et cetera. Where does the information fit into that dimension? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, I mean, this kind of a cliche to say data is the new oil, but that is increasingly a subject of intense geopolitical competition. Um, but would you separate, would you separate yeah. data from, in, from information? So when I think about mm -hmm. like all we're constantly hearing, well, we already know to your point, China kind of had their own network, so they had the great firewall, mm -hmm. so they control the information that comes in, so they don't want you know, Western social media or Google to influence their people. Um, and now today we continue just pounding into our head misinformation, misinformation, uh, you know, from the globalist, the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. all the way down to the, the Biden administration, misinformation. So it seems like uh, the war is about controlling money and controlling information. Would you put data and information in there together? Um, I, I would say information in the sense of like consumable content. content. Yeah. 
that human beings can ingest to understand is a subset of all data, right? So okay. there's lots of packets going across the internet, whether it's transactions for, you know, just sort of stock trades that are, are, are not human readable. And so, yeah, like competition and, and state interest in controlling, say, another nation's ability to influence what your domestic population is consuming mm -hmm. as like, you know, information, you know, that determines their political attitudes, their beliefs about, say, conflicts, who's responsible or who isn't for a particular foreign conflict, to try to shape attitudes and motivations uh, at a domestic level. That's a, that's a capability that a lot of states have always invested in to try to, say, plant stories in a foreign newspaper. But it took a lot of effort. You had to, like, have an intelligence operation to recruit a journalist in a foreign country and, you know, try to do, you know, strategic influence operations to shape kind of policy making or broader public perceptions. I think one of what has been accelerated with the advent of sort of global platforms for technology is that that game is now playing out um, at a much faster scale in a much more fine tuned manner where you can, you, can, you can have sort of active operations to influence perception across borders. So global platforms, both US based platforms as well as you know, foreign platforms for social media, for news, et cetera, are, are, are pervasive across multiple different jurisdictions. And that is that when you're in a global world where you know, there weren't as intense, you know, state rivalries and competition over political influence operations. They could kind of like let it simmer in the background. Now we have acute tensions at play. Now we have live, you know, issues where states are trying to manipulate the ability of, you know, other citizens to perceive what, you know, is happening and what views they should hold. And that is where the tension between open, free discourse in a civil society starts to run up against concerns about, say, foreign influence operations or deception by say, you know, parties that have control over algorithms um, that aren't that aren't visible to the public. That's that's seeing what what feeds are generated. Um, and yeah, this is a that is a subset like the competition over information. Um, and it's really premised on the fact that we now live in a global technological civilization that uses these platforms to share information um, on a global scale. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I talk about all the time is uh, kind of these three converging cycles and it's the political cycle, 250 year political cycle, 80 year uh, financial cycle, but a 50 year tech cycle. And how when you look back through history, it's always technology that changes the world the most because it changes the way that we organize, communicate, uh, work, etc. And um, it's almost like technology is just advancing way faster than our civilization or really our political structures have advanced. So mm -hmm. if you look back to like the Industrial Revolution, which was obviously a big technological revolution and it really created this centralization and then it led into kind of uh, you know Henry Ford with the assembly line mass production and then you had mass production so you had mass amounts of people working on the assembly lines and you had to come up with a management structure that, uh, that uh, managed them all like a cog in a wheel. So mm -hmm. even though you're way smarter than me, we work on the assembly line next to each other, we do the exact same job. And so we, had, we come up with mass management uh, for managing the masses and then you kind of had this political structure that's set up on top of that. But today, now we're in this uh, information world. Uh, we're no longer in that world, but the political structures really haven't changed, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And I guess these types of technologies are really going to try to, uh, I mean, either, either we're going to force that change or they're going to restrict the technologies. I guess those are kind of the two options that we're running into. Yeah, I think you're seeing this tension play out with AI is like one particular example where the pace of change is happening relatively faster than what, the, say, the political institutions and regulatory bodies can accommodate. And so there's essentially a bargaining process that we're witnessing unfold between the political economy of the sort of um, technical private sector actors that are leading the development and deployment of, of these tools and the regulators who are facing this, this challenge of do they let it the horse off the leash um, or do they try to harness it without you know, crushing its potential to, um, you know, transform their economies. And they're, they're struggling with that right now. And I think this is a, an age old version of an old or new version of an age old question of where's the balance between, um, you know, adapting your institutions to meet the pace of the, of the technology change. At what point though, is the pace of that technology change to sort of outstrip the capacity of those institutions to um, reform themselves or adapt over time. And not, not just, not yeah. just outstrip them of their ability to transform, but it, sort of makes them obsolete in a sense where like that structure was set up for the time at the at when it was set up but mm -hmm. we're not in that time anymore and that structure doesn't really make sense anymore either maybe well it's interesting i think you're seeing a reconfiguration or reconceptualization of what sorts of political structures win or lose in a in this sort of maybe um in, in this new world, right? So China has a certain model of what you might call like authoritarianism as a service or sort of um, techno-authoritarian governance where they, they, they're they trying to leverage the fact that widespread surveillance, artificial intelligence tools, connecting everyone's activities and behaviors into, you know, essentially into the, into the, the state monitoring system allows them to more efficiently manage 
uh, essentially a authoritarian structure, right, where it's a one-party state rule. And they, they, they're sort of trying to test that thesis of, can you actually have central government run a complex society using technology to help, you know, um, uh, mitigate the, you know, the legacy kind of Hayekian information problem, right? Like, can you actually centrally, um, you know, uh, compute all the relevant information that you need in order to maintain that centralized control. But it is an attractive proposition that China is trying to sort of model for the rest of the world is saying, we can help bootstrap your economies you know, into the digital age, we'll, but we'll, it'll come with these tight control um, knobs that, that allow you to kind of tune to make sure it doesn't um, uh, sp spin out of control. I think in the Western system, we're struggling with it in a different way because it does empower you know, certain elements in the society, often at the expense of, might say, like liberal democracy, right? You get a concentration of data in, in the hands of you know, opaque uh, you know, big tech firms and, and, and government agencies that gives them insight that, it, that the public doesn't have necessarily. And so with that comes power, with, with, that, with that asymmetry, potentially challenges the, like, the premise of kind of uh, you know, the, um, the de Tocqueville uh, kind of democratic ideal where like, you know, everyone is someone on an equal playing field, they can have a participatory, like a participatory civic discourse, you know, resolved issues and debates in the public square, and then vote and you know, you know, that's how it goes. But now we might be entering an era where technology fundamentally, um, you know, constrains that vision of, of liberal democratic discourse, uh, upon which, you know, you know, our political institutions were. Were, were premised, and I guess we'll, we'll see. I mean, there's other technology forces that was, you know, obviously in Bitcoin that sort of represent a different trend, right? You know, there's technology trends that lead to a centralization of data and access to sort of critical choke points, and there's technology trends that lead to, uh, you know, disaggregation, decentralization of those sorts of um, nodes. And I think that's the battle you're seeing in the, in the, in the sort of the, the evolution of Bitcoin in particular, where, where that, that, um, that debate <laughs> is playing out in real time. Yeah. Um I want to I want to pull on that thread a little bit more, and I know you know you get into a lot of this stuff, including philosophy. So it'd be fun to kind of just game plan this, but kind of back to what I was saying, which was, um, you know, if if one form of government, if technology caused centralization, which caused a form of government, but now we have technology creating the opposite force, which is decentralization. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have giant corporations with uh, people working them in the United States. We don't have railroad and steel industries anymore, right? So we don't have these big operations now. We have um, small, independent people working all over the world o over the internet, right? Um, mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, the governments have continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger, more powerful, but people have got more and more decentralized at the same time. So we have like two opposite forces almost where governments getting bigger and more centralized and to your point, um, centralizing all these data sources inside, you know, hands of corporations. But at the same time, you have people that are decentralizing and moving apart and have all different interests based off of their locale that they're in, et cetera. And so... Uh, I guess I kind of asked that question, but do, do we kind of hit a wall? And it sort of seems like we are, so it seems like the, the governments want to continue the growth trajectory, uh, but then at the same time, the technology is pushing this decentralization, decentralization technology. I guess we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I don't know. Um, it's just, it's, it's interesting to watch that play out. And, and it's really this power struggle. But jumping back into kind of this uh, techno-industrial war. So before mm -hmm. we kind of dive into that, I want to dive in. You, you've already kind of mentioned China's role. So I want to talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit more. But before we do, if we just kind of like, um, again, like playing the game of risk, uh, first identifying who the players mm -hmm. at the board are, right? And so then understand that they each have their own regions and own interests, right? So, um, you know, I might look at it like uh, we kind of obviously have this war with Russia going on right now which seems to me like is kind of like this stand against globalism almost where like uh, NATO and the WEF or whatever are kind of going after that. So, you know, but now we have kind of China that seems to sort of kind of be partnering with Russia. So I don't know if there's like the U.S. potentially with, you know, Euro Davos NATO. And then we have kind of Russia, we have China, and then maybe we have like the global south, the BRICS. And maybe those are different players, but then maybe really Russia, China working together. Maybe China is just the big dog, and maybe it's the U.S. and China. Like, how do you kind of view that game board? I mean, it's, it's immensely complex, and I think there's a lot of different frames. I think one useful frame is like a simple triangle where the three points of the triangle are um, like credit, uh, commodities, and production. And you look at what are the geopolitical power blocks that are sort of relatively dominant in each of those, like, you know, like kind of key elements of the global system, right? So, like, credit or money is dominated by G7, right? It's dominated by, by the U.S. and its G7 allies. Um, you know, those are the largest, you know, economies. They're also, you know, the dominant financial centers, right? And the, the um, influence or the power that that part of the triangle deploys is mainly through, um, you know, control over the financial system, sanctions, 
overall global regulation, kind of the rule of law that, that, that defines kind of the global system that's been constructed post-45. The other leg, of the other sort of point of the triangle would be like the commodity point, and that's essentially OPEC plus. So that's basically Saudis and Russia, right? So that is, they're providing the dominant raw inputs into the global system, right? Oil and you know, raw commodities for, for, the, for the consumption of, of, the, of mostly the West. And then you have uh, production, which is mostly China, right? And so they are the, they're, the, they're the manufacturing engine of the world. They're the largest trade partner for almost you know, the vast majority of, 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 of the countries on the planet. And they're increasingly using their role as a manufacturing powerhouse to build up their military capacity. And so each of those kind of three points in the sort of global system, when they were kind of in frenemy mode, that's how you got globalization. That's how you got, you know, the post-Soviet collapse era sort of unipolar hegemonic moment where everyone thought everyone would just be getting rich. China would join the WTO. Russia would eventually sort of accommodate to more of like a, you know, a close relationship with Europe as their energy provider. Middle East was always going to be maybe a little bit of a problem, but we had the oil supply secured with a good close bilateral relationship between the U.S. and the Saudis, and the kind of the world system would just kind of churn along. And I think what we're seeing in the past few years is that that, that frenemy mode relationship between those points of the system is sort of starting to break down, right? Obviously, the, 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 the Ukraine um, war is a good example of where like the, the relationship between G7 capital and uh, OPEC plus, specifically Russia, is, is broken, right? Like that's the sanctions, that is the export um, restrictions, that's the oil price cap, et cetera. On the other leg between, say, G7 and China, you're seeing, you know, not as an extreme breakdown is between um, Russia and, and the G7 over Ukraine, but you're seeing increasing tension, export controls, technology restrictions on China. We had the trade war under Trump, the increasing, you know, concerns and anxiety over uh, Taiwan invasion scenarios, quote unquote, decoupling or de-risking um, uh, among major multinationals about their approach to China as a base of manufacturing operations, et cetera. So that is like how I would view like the main global players is, is, is like, you know, money, uh, commodities and production. And then, of course, over, on top of all that, right, you have like the idiosyncratic kind of, um, uh, I'd say, like structure that has developed in terms of um, uh, like just just money itself. Right. There's the G7 as like a power structure that's defined by like formal government institutions. But you've also had just so much wealth generated in non-government spaces that that has now and I think an increasingly relevant like geopolitical effect. But those those that money doesn't really to first order like carry a flag. Right, like Chinese oligarchs and Russian oligarchs and Saudi oligarchs and oligarchs of any other stripe around the world, like to, to first order, they're oligarchs and they can be compelled or coerced by their respective flags to, you know, maybe sing the patriotic tune when push comes to show. But ultimately, their, their, their actions in the global system are the fact that they control massive amounts of capital and their first order you know, motivation is to protect that capital and influence whatever jurisdiction that capital's in to protect their interests. And so that, that, that can involve you know, corrupting Western democracies. It can involve um, you know, doing other things in the global system that, that oftentimes don't directly align with you know, the, the state capital um, and their geopolitical prerogatives. But that, that's like a new wrinkle between the basic structure of kind of money production and, and commodities and now you just have a huge amount of private wealth and and it's and it now has um, a, a lot of influence but it kind of fits within these three roles that you said credit money mm -hmm. commodities or production and so most of that wealth <clears throat> it, that these oligarchs control would actually fit under one of those buckets under commodities or under production mm -hmm. to your point right if chinese oligarchs it fits under production russian oligarchs it fits under commodities kind of a thing right so you could still mm -hmm. and then uh, u.s oligarchs it fits under finance uh, exactly yeah right? and and i think one of the tensions you're seeing is like just to take one example is the Chinese, uh, like um, the U.S.-China relationship and the political economy inside the United States of what sort of stance the United States should take towards China, as you know the the, the their growing strategic challenge is becoming more acute. And from like the perspective of those inside the Washington D.C. that represent the Defense Department, the intelligence community, kind of the political apparatus, the Treasury Department, you know, it's all about preparing to you know meet this threat. It's it's more of an antagonistic aggressive posture, technology controls, export controls, etc. If you're a venture capital or private equity or a Wall Street manager, right? Your your, your first order concern is I got I want to keep, 
you know, growing my my PL. I want to keep selling into this market. Right. And you don't necessarily want to break this trade relationship. You don't want to break the the bilateral capital flows. You're getting you've been you've been riding up on this hog of globalization and Chinese sort of um, asset recycling into or Chinese surplus recycling into Western assets. That has really benefited uh, you know essentially Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Um, and and now we're seeing this you know this tension play out between the interests of that part of the political economy in the United States and the national security interests um, coming out of D.C. Um, and that that is a that the version of that argument you're seeing also take place in say Germany between you know the folks inside Germany that have a really strong interest in you know trade with China um, and those that you know are trying to be pulled by the West into a more antagonistic um, relationship. Yeah. Boy, what a tangled web that is. So it's sort of like everybody kind of operated in this uh, this three parts of the triangle in this symbiotic mm -hmm. relationship, and now it's gotten to the point where it's like, well, now each person sort of has their own interests or maybe wants to move a little bit further up, like China. Uh, maybe we want a little bit more than just being the manufacturing hub of the world. Maybe we mm -hmm. want to be the superpower. And so now you sort of have these... Uh, uh, these these different competing people wanting to get more. Unfortunately, then that starts to upset the balance of power, mm -hmm. and then everybody starts scrambling, and then the whole thing kind of falls apart, I guess is kind of where we're at. So we have, um, to this kind of increased pressure, uh, I, I went through, I actually covered this on a recent video, and really maybe it goes back to like Trump really starting kind of this, this trade war with China, the mm -hmm. tariffs, things like that, starting to um, slap sanctions on their technologies, specifically like going after Huawei, kind of a thing like that. Um, and then it really accelerated with Biden putting down this chip mandate where like we can no longer supply uh, any parts uh, or even uh, production equipment to China for like level two, three chips, things like that. Uh, and now we're seeing China uh, retaliate um, saying that they're going to hold back uh, gallium and gypsum, I think, two different uh, kind of rare earth um, elements that we need. So now we're seeing the war escalate, and of course it does. That's how things work, right? They always escalate. But it seems like, and maybe it was made abundantly clear after the pandemic, that like because the U.S. has really outsourced so much production, we rely so much on China, we really can't decouple. And so we start getting to this kind of retaliate, retaliatory war, but like, where does that lead? I mean, it's kind of like mutually assured destruction almost, isn't it? Yes, and I think that's the tit for tat that we've been embarked that we've been going through really since yeah that October seventh um, export control order that 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 the White House signed uh, restricting China's access to leading edge semiconductor production um, equipment as well as sort of the actual sort of Western talent, and they tried to make that like a multilateral restriction. So originally it was the U.S., but then they're really trying to get the other key um, players in the global semi semiconductor supply chain principally the Dutch, the South Koreans, uh, and the Japanese to come on board. And now that they have kind of been able to get s at least those key players to tack in the direction of the United States with sort of these, plur the, these plurilateral and multilateral export controls, China has, you know, trying is trying to retaliate, right? And because they're fundamentally in a weak position relative to that dimension of the leading technology, they're retaliating on their advantage, which is on the raw commodity um, inputs to that to that high technology supply chain. So so gallium and germanium is where you know two two critical um, commodity inputs that they have the like the, the almost the like the monopoly control over. Um, it, it was time just before Secretary Yellen is over there now for a visit. So I think a lot of this is about signaling. It's about tit for tat. It's about posturing in, in this negotiation. Um, you know, six months ago, people were really pessimistic on the direction of travel of the U.S.-China relationship. It was ironically, it was the balloon incident that was like the thing that really knocked everything off the off off the rails. Secretary Blinken was supposed to go there, and it kind of helped smooth over at least some of the fallout from the the chip controls. But that didn't happen. Instead, just things got much worse. Um, and I think there was a lot of back channeling, a lot of like desire on both parties to at least structurally shift the relationship up a bit now. I think stepping back, everyone has an interest in, uh, especially China, because of their economic sort of um, weakness right now, is not to like aggravate things. And I think everyone recognizes that when we shift into 2024 presidential campaign season, that the ability to any to do any sort of positive, you know, bilaterals anything is going to be impossible. So it's like get the relationship as back to an even keel as possible this year, knowing that it's likely going to deteriorate again next year. Um, that's kind of think. That's like the tactical stuff. I think, in general, there's a big debate happening about whether fundamentally the relationship is like inevitably confrontational, right? That there's just the structural imperatives that are driving China's rise, 
it just the United States can't accommodate them into the global system. It's like we have to make some fundamental trade-offs to the way we run the world order in order to accommodate China's objectives. Like, you know, we can we can negotiate on any particular issue, but fundamentally they want to have their own geoeconomic sphere of influence. They don't want to feel sort of hemmed in in the first island chain and subject to the sort of coercive power of the U.S. monetary and military um, uh, alliance system and the security architecture in the Western Pacific. Like, they fundamentally want to change that. They want to, you know, uh, like, peel us, off, peel us back from the Western Pacific, and we don't want that to happen. Right. So we can have these sort of, you know, we don't, in any given tactical moment, like, no one wants everything to blow up, but the relationship is sort of in, seems to be in a, like a structural downtrend. Um, because and, yeah, they want to rise and we want to hold them back. And then those two things aren't, uh, those things don't, don't work together. <laughs> they want to rise, we want to hold them back. And at some point, one of, somebody has to give. It is. It's, it's um, you know, there's a mentality that's, I think, on both sides of the Pacific that's somewhat zero sum. Um, it, whether it's objectively true or not is somewhat irrelevant. If everyone thinks it's zero sum, then that's what's going to drive the dynamic. Um, and especially on high technology. So that's the thing that's made this, I think, more complicated than just like territorial disputes or unification of Taiwan is that we have a perception among every other, every major player in the global system that if you can't keep up with the frontier of emerging technology, that you'll fundamentally like forever fall behind as a global power. And so China is facing this like existential challenge. They see their demographic situation in the next 10 years really declining. They see, you know, you know, they have dominance in global trade, but they're trying to move up the value chain very, very quickly. Um, and they're doing it from a position of relative weakness, right? They're trying to catch up. Um, and now the hegemon is, is sort of belatedly turned its attention to this rising challenger and is now pulling out all the stops to try to keep its relative advantage as big as possible and is willing to do things that, from China's perspective, sort of border on, uh, you know, economic war, right? Like, we're just, we're just going to blanket, you know, cut off your access to, like, for example, like leading edge GPUs, which if everyone thinks AI is going to be like the critical kind of general purpose technology of the next 10, 20 X years, if China can't get access to that technology, they're sort of fundamentally restricted from developing their economy. And they view that as potentially an existential threat to them, right? The whole premise of the party's legitimacy and stability is they, they continue to deliver economic growth, you know, year after year. You know, that's the, that was the trade-off, essentially. Yeah. You have one party rule, but we give you, you know, 6% GDP growth every year and, you know, rising living standards and house prices that keep going up. How effective will the U.S. be at, at kneecapping them with the technology? I mean, a lot of people would just say, well, they'll just develop their own chips. They don't need, you know, they don't need us. They'll just develop their own chips. They already have. They already have high-tech mm -hmm. chips, et cetera. So uh, how effective are that, and, and how hard would it be, in your opinion, for China to try to catch up uh, without the U.S. helping, or even, even while the U.S. is trying to hold them back? It's, it's, I mean, this is like the trillion-dollar question. I think it's a function of time, like in the near term, say three to five years, it, um, there's really little chance that China can, for example, um, recreate what the, the Dutch lithography um, producer ASML has with their extreme ultraviolet uh, lithography equipment. Um, that is, you know, that was like a 30 year R&D project by, you know, a multi, multi billion dollar firm that had like access to the most advanced German optics. And, you know, just it was like. It was like it's the premier technology of human civilization. Like it's the most advanced thing that human beings have ever created. China is very smart. China has a lot of, of has a lot, a lot of capability. They're putting hundred plus billion dollars a year into this, so they could, as a moonshot, try to get there. Um, I think that's their objective. Um, it's very hard to just like semiconductors is sort of like the like the the quintessential global. Uh, product, right? Like no single country specializes. It's the new oil, right? It's yeah. the new oil. And, and it just, it, well, it, one critical distinction with oil is like, you can just pump oil out of the ground. You don't need 20 trade partners, each producing right. a very specialized component and, and a highly configured complex supply chain to generate, you know, a semiconductor that goes into your iPhone. Like that's what the global system has, has enabled is cross-border trade, specialization, et cetera. And China was a part of that integrated, very complex supply chain. Um, so that system breaks down. It's more likely that no one gets semiconductors than trying to get semiconductors. So, so it's more a function of does, instead of trying to catching up, do they just try to spoil the fun, right? Like if, and this is the risk, is that if China feels that they can never 
get access to the technological frontier, and that every year that goes by means that the advantage of the West is going to you know, steadily increase, and that it may be in a few years that technological advantage will translate into a more material military advantage, then China's ambitions to unify with Taiwan and carve out a larger geoeconomic sphere of influence for themselves might be forever foreclosed. And so this might actually precipitate more, say, um, um, aggressive action in the near term to just spoil the party. Blow yeah, up if the I can't have it, nobody can have it kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and say, okay, like, if you're going to try to block us from accessing this technology, we'll just make sure no one can have it. Yeah. Which what about, be- what, what do you think, I mean, this is more of a political, maybe even philosophical <laughs> question, but, you know, China being a communist uh, country and the amount of control they have, you know, I would believe that that limits the creativity and uh, motivations that, and desires that the people have. Um, and it seems like maybe that's one reason why we still have so much creativity. We have so much of this new development mm-hmm. happening in the United States in, in you know, a free country. Um, so even if China puts uh, all the money towards it, do they have the people necessary? Mm-hmm. Does, their, does their culture, does their political structure cultivate that type of uh, creativity to develop those things? It's interesting. I mean, that's a, yeah, it feels like a, a cultural question. You kind of have to And political. It. Yeah, political question, because, I mean, for example, there's one study, I forget who did it, it was a few months ago, where they looked at, um, uh, I forget the exact details, but they're looking at, like, patents. So if you look by patents, uh, like, like in, in high technology, China, especially like in AI, for example, or quantum information sciences, if you look at, like, the, 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 the production of new ideas, which patents might represent, China has actually climbed pretty dramatically to the top ranks of the global system. Where they have struggled is in translating say those raw sort of technology insights or ground or sort of scientific um, results into commercial products because they don't have like a as much of an open free market in the domestic system they don't you know especially post the jack ma you know interrogation yeah. like entrepreneurship has a cap right like there's a you know in the united states you can start you can found a startup become a unicorn make a billion dollars in a few years in China, it, like you're going to quickly hit into a political wall if you if you ever get if you ever get that successful, yeah. and so there, that does kind of impose a fundamental constraint on their innovation capacity as a, as a society potentially, where they can generate a lot of state directed R and D, they can generate a lot of you know research labs to crank out like all the high end optical blah 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 quantum stuff, but turning that into like a market um, you know d- uh, delivered product and service that can turn to a multi-billion dollar business, that's the thing the United States has historically been the best in the world at. Mm-hmm. Solving um, problems. Yeah, and, and commercializing those and, yeah. then, and then you know, turning them into world-leading businesses. And so that is, that is an interesting challenge. Um, but, I mean, China's objectives, at least in the near term, may not be to be Google and Apple of the world. It may be they just need to have enough DF-16s, DF-17s, DF-21s, you know, uh, uh, Frigates, uh, you know, they basically just need to build enough missiles and have enough satellite capacity to prosecute a victorious, you know, um, operation in the South China Sea. So, like, they might be, like, structurally hindered from, say, seizing the commanding heights of the Fifth Industrial Revolution or whatever it is that they write in their, their, their party strategy. But tactically speaking, that may not prevent them from, from accruing the relevant military capacity um, in, the, in the near term to displace the United States in a tactical conflict scenario. Because while we have like a really, I say strong structural advantage, cultural advantage when it comes to innovation, capital markets, et cetera, like our military capacity, our, our sort of shipbuilding capacity, our defense industrial base, um, the fact that we're spread around the whole global system, try to you know, secure global trade routes, et cetera, you know, makes us vulnerable potentially, especially in the next you know, three to five years, sort of the acute sort of window of danger where the deteriorating sort of U.S. military um, sort of hard power capacity, you know, might run up against China's really aggressive ramping up and building ships, missiles, um, et cetera. So that's that's the danger zone is if we get to this period where, you know, China feels they have to go for it before the window closes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pulling on that thread a little bit more. Um, and, and I guess if, the, if we really frame it up, these, these, these are the two, you know, these are the two big uh, superpowers that are kind of coming into conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd, I'd asked you about when we had the conversation uh, uh, previously getting onto this call um, about, you know, I'd read this article um, 
talking about these uh, these GSA banks and potentially mm -hmm. even like the four largest banks in the world, uh, bank accounts in the world are Chinese owned banks, mm -hmm. uh, trillions of dollars sitting in offshore bank accounts. And how really what we've seen with the bank runs happening in the United States, uh, we're just triggered by people taking their money out of the bank. And mm -hmm. they just take their money out of one bank and put it into bank number two, just push a button, doesn't cause that person any problem, but the bank goes down. Mm -hmm. And it basically talked about how like the largest bank in the United States being JP Morgan had like uh, 860 million, I'm sorry, $860 billion uh, on its books or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're like, these accounts have trillions of dollars. And all they got to do is just transfer from account A to account B and just mm -hmm. whack them all, just bank drop, 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 drop. Um, I understand that, I mean, as big as that is, we also have other oligarchs and we have the whole euro dollar system potentially as well. Mm -hmm. But it seems like uh, very easily there could be a financial attack as well, which of course, mm -hmm. back to mutually destroyed destruction, I mean, they're sitting on all these treasuries. I mean, they don't want to ruin the mm -hmm. financial system either, but I guess they have that weapon. Do you see that as something that's a, that's a legit threat out there? Uh, I do, and it gets it gets very complicated because, like any other conflict scenario, right? There's never there's never a, like a zero cost attack, right? Every every, every attack that you know uh, someone decides to 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 execute is going to come with some cost, right? Sure. So there's just like you know a military attack, you might lose you know twenty five percent or twenty percent of your forces. Yeah. Um, so you think you need to apply, but that doesn't mean they're not going to launch the attack, right? It's whether it's strategically justified or whether they think they have a high chance of like strategic victory. So I think you need to apply the same logic to sort of financial warfare as you do to, you know, actual warfare. And I think you need to analyze uh, the position that, you know, that, the, that the Chinese government and Chinese, say, private sector proxies have accrued over the past 20 years as the sort of globalized system has, like, really accelerated the capital recycling from Chinese surpluses into Western assets, right? Trillions of dollars that Chinese entities have accrued, like the basic recycling mechanism have kind of gone through like two routes. There's like the official route of, you know, government sector dollar surpluses, foreign exchange reserves going into dollar based assets, principally US treasury securities held on the books of either, you know, the central bank, SAFE, like the, the state um, administration for foreign exchange, which is the PBOC's uh, sovereign wealth fund. Um, there's a whole book being uh, that was just written by uh, someone from the Council on Foreign Relations that analyzes kind of this network of sovereign wealth funds or even what they call sovereign leverage funds that China has created to redirect those dollar surpluses um, away from, say, dollar treasury securities into, like, the Belt and Road Initiative, right, to try to secure right. strategic influence in the global south, buy up assets, ports, et cetera. Um, and that was, that's kind of like on the official side, right? These are official actors recycling surpluses and, you know, getting strategic influence. This more like covert recycling mechanism is probably potentially much more dangerous, which is um, trillions of dollars that go through sort of a hop of, 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 of shell companies, right? A Hong Kong LLC to a Cayman Islands LLC or a Luxembourg LLC, a Malta LLC, et cetera, that ends up um, investing in a U.S. hedge fund, a pension fund, uh, an IPO, et cetera, just a regular listed equity. Um, you know, accruing large stakes. And with large stakes in Western assets comes influence, right? right. So before you press the sell button, which is like the nuclear button, uh, you actually have a lot of influence. You can get, maybe you get a seat on the board of that public or private company. Maybe um, that buys you a seat at the fundraising dinner for that politician. Maybe it allows you to do things with money in our political system that allows you to exert lots of, um, lots of influence. Uh, and Chinese uh, uh, entities, whether it's oligarchs or other affiliated group, um, sort of United Front Work Department, um, uh, uh, you say, like, agents of, of influence, have leveraged that money and capital to influence Western democracies um, and sort of corrupt our processes. That, that does give them a position, potentially, of having, you know, I think that, that particular article you know, talks about kind of the extreme case of that influence being, well, a lot of these Western financial institutions have pretty thin sort of uh, pr uh, sort of cover on their on their outflows. So if $10 billion of depositors decide to leave one day, they have to, have to cover that by selling assets because they're allowed to hold like very little liquid capital. Um, and that is what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, right? Where basically within a day or two, like $40 billion of depositors just left and that basically killed the bank. The FDIC had to come in and make those depositors whole. And, if, and I think they even made that public that some of the largest depositors were Chinese investors, were Chinese um, you know, entities that had billions of dollars in deposits that were effectively backstopped by the FDIC. Um, and that is, and that was like official, like it was a Chinese company. Um, there's 
you know, probably a lot more that's not like obviously a Chinese company. That's just an entity that if you traced all those hops back would probably be tied to, you know, some some entity that has, you know, that is in control of those Chinese surpluses that have been routed in the offshore dollar system. And that is a it's an un, underappreciated acute kind of vulnerability um, in our in our in our financial system that we've just sort of exposed ourselves to by virtue of the, uh, the status of the dollar being global reserve currency, by being the economy that has to run these structural deficits, that we have to absorb global surpluses. We have to sell off at, you know, our, our, our desirable assets, our real estate, our equities, et cetera, to foreign surpluses. Uh, and those are principally now our geopolitical adversaries, right? right. It, is, it is the Russians, the Chinese, it's the, it's the GCC, it's sort of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, sort of block that has those those dollar surpluses that controls most of those Western assets. That's not a very it's not a position of relative strength no. to go into a financial and economic war um, with those individuals. I think it's a I think it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, big problem. What do you think? Fed now the launch of Fed now will help that, or will that make it worse? Um, Fed now is a little bit different. I think what what was maybe a uh, stopgap measure was the BTF. P, the the bank term funding program yeah. that they put in after the that initial panic and you had Credit Suisse going down. So I think the, I, I just mean like uh, mm-hmm. if it's able to move money faster, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what the Fed now system is allows money to move between banks faster. So if the Chinese did want to move money from one mm-hmm. bank to the next uh, to cause bank runs, does that mm-hmm. speed that process up, or does uh, Fed now have like gates put in where they could say, hey, I saw you know you can't move more than a hundred thousand at a time, so mm-hmm. we you know we don't allow them to move ten billion at a time, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. I mean. I don't know if it fundamentally changes because bank runs are fundamentally driven by um, driven by psychology, less by like the plumbing, right? Because if, if everyone shows up tomorrow and wants to take their money out, right? But we're not talking about everybody showing up. We're talking about a, a we're talking about a you know some sort of a like Chinese a yeah. Chinese arm saying, "Hey, mm-hmm. just move a hundred billion from this account to that account," and now that bank just shuts down. Um, it, it, it could make it easier to have like yeah, like if you did it on a Friday, it doesn't happen until Monday, but now it can happen pretty quickly. Um, right. I think it, maybe on the margin it helps. Uh, you know, any any time it makes like deposits move more efficiently out of a bank, if those banks are fundamentally fragile, that raises this risk. And if someone yeah. can, you know, if someone has malintent and has the the, the the capital and the willingness to deploy it, you know, maybe it makes it, um, you know, on the margin more vulnerable. Um, I think the Fed's actions were to try to mitigate the because the premise of this attack isn't just your own deposits. You're trying to trigger a bank run. You're trying to trigger like multiples of your own deposits to flee at the same time because you probably don't have enough on your own to just do everything. But these, right? these Chinese accounts do. They may, but maybe, I mean, but that's also a lot of your own equity to put, like you'd want to get a multiplier effect, right? If you had a $10 billion, you want that to cause $50 billion to move out, right? Just, you want, that's what you would want to, you want to have a multiplier on your, right. on your effects. So, so a little bit of it. propaganda in the media and then yeah, some big so transfers, media, the next thing you know. Yeah. You want to yeah. try to do everything you can to, um, to, to amplify your, your actions, right? You don't want to just be the pure mechanics of, of your own, your own action. You want it to be amplified by its effect on everyone else. Um, and so I think, I mean, fundamentally though, this is just a banking system is, uh, issue. I mean, there's probably similar issues you could, you could imagine in the shadow banking system that aren't, aren't as like obvious. Um, I think the Fed's actions is fundamentally just to like agree to bail everyone out if need be, right? Like that's their only hope. Like that was the BTFB. That was what the swap lines were about for Credit Suisse. Like it was okay. Like yes, a few may die. But we're going to stand here and we're going to tell you, like, wherever you need it, we'll give you dollars if you need it, right? And that, that potentially mitigates this attack because then it says, okay, you can take your $10 billion out, but if that bank ever gets in trouble because of that, we're going to bail it out. We're not going to let it fail. Yeah. And, you know, that's what we did. Now we have ETFB. Now, we, you know, swap lines are... And there's no reason for consumers to pull their money out because we're going to backstop all that money as well. So, yeah. so why, why, why hassle with transferring money? We just, we'll, we'll take care of it. Yeah. So th- that attack may, may have may have fizzled out in that particular mechanism, but at the cost of now changing kind of the structure of our deposit. Do you think, uh, do you think from an adversarial, now that we've sort of framed this up this way, do you think Jerome Powell's actions might be potentially to bring these oligarch GSIB euro dollar markets come to heel, come back to Mm -hmm. daddy, so to speak, maybe they've gotten so big. uh, And uh, if he 
raises interest rates, you know, 5x, he, it obviously works to your point in multiples. So it, they're all levered up. It works to them multiples mm-hmm. as well. And so maybe what Jerome Powell is doing, you know, as a, as a Bitcoiner, what we always hear is that they will never give up control over money because they, you know, they don't, they, they want to let Bitcoin to succeed because they don't want to give up control over money. Well, who doesn't want to give up control over money? Mm. Does, does uh, Jamie Dimon, Jay Powell, the New York Fed, do they want to give up control over the dollar to the ECB, the euro, the PBOC, B, right, whatever? So, like, they're all, they all want to gain control. And so, anyway, back to the question. Uh, do you think that potentially what Jerome Powell is doing is really trying to secure the dollar for dollar's sake, not really the U.S. economy, but the dollar? And by raising rates this fast, it's sort of draining a lot of that liquidity or that leverage those accounts have? I mean... He's probably got multiple motives, and it's whether it's you know him as an individual or whether it's like the structural incentives of the institution. Those might be slightly different. Um, I think one very one like that's like a very broad question. Like one case study maybe to examine that could that's like maybe an indicator of of this is the shift to SOFR from LIBOR, right? Because right. the lesson of the financial crisis was that even when things were going pear shaped and the Fed was aggressively trying to cut the Fed funds rate, LIBOR was stubbornly high. And because most of like US um, floating rates were premised on LIBOR, like most of the rates that actually inform economic decision making, like credit cards and household loans and car loans were premised on LIBOR, that even though the Fed was trying to cut rates, LIBOR was stuck high because it was controlled in London. And it was controlled by a consortium of bankers that were just texting each other, right, <laughs> like that we can control. And it took a political intervention to basically by the Fed to talk to the politicians essentially running uh, uh, in London that talked to the Bank of England, that talked to the banks that said you have to cut LIBOR now. Um, I think, I think the number two at the time of the Bank of England, his name is Paul Tucker, he recently came out and told this, this anecdote basically where, you know, the phones are ringing off the hook from, from – from DC and New York Fed saying like you have to like bring the rates down. So this was right. that was a that's an example of where they now they felt that oh like US interest rate trans- policy transmission was a function of some offshore foreign banking cartel that we don't control. Like we're not going to have that. We're not going to we're not going to we're, we're not going to stand by, right? Yeah. So they're going to shift everything to SOFR, which we're is not letting someone else pr- um, set the price of money. We're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to control it and we're going to yeah. have the ability to influence the, you know, the full money markets um, much more tightly. Uh, from DC and from the New York Fed, um, and that's a, like now a strategic imperative. Um, bef- and I think COVID accelerated this as well. Um, and so this is where I think just like one example. Uh, I think the zoom out. There's like lots of people have told the complex story of the euro dollar system and the Fed's sort of love hate relationship with it, right? Over different periods of time, where they felt maybe in certain historical moments. It was a strategic benefit to sort of let the European banks kind of go crazy and do what they wanted to do, because that would help internationalize the dollar system, right. create more liquidity for offshore sort of dollar bonds. This would you know provide more liquidity, say, for the Saudis to invest in, you know, et cetera. That this would all sort of be a geopolitical advantage to us. But like everything else, it also gets to certain moments where, oh, well, they, well, they go too far, and now we have to bail them out. And now we're bailing out European banks, just like we did in 2008. Right. where we had to spend way more money bailing out European banks than any U.S. bank. Um, and, you know, geopolitically, when you're, when you're in a frenemy mode, maybe you bail out your friends. But, you know, us and the Europeans, we're kind of getting a little bit frosty with, you know, data regulations and, you know, you know, investment subsidies on renewable energy, yeah. liquid natural gas, you know, policy about NATO versus Russia, China. Dec- like, you know, it's not as easy as a simple relationship of just you're in the dollar orbit and therefore we're going to bail you out. Um, it does get, I mean, the, the final like, point is that the money system is fundamentally geopolitical, right? right? People can think that it's just, you know, it's just the neutral technocratic administration of the economy, but it is, it is ultimately a, ge- a geopolitical um, uh, the fact that they would like this uh, euro dollar market to grow just so they continue to push the dollar, you know, dollar mark, dollar markets across the globe. Then if you look at like U.S. dollar back stable coins, I mean, isn't mm. that effectively a similar thing where the U.S. dollar has really grown across the globe through stable coins, specifically in you know areas like uh, Africa, et cetera, Central mm. America. But yet the administration seems to be very unfriendly to stable coins. And do you think that's more of like a, a Biden admin with a Warren Gensler, and mm-hmm. that's different than the interest that might Jerome Powell and the Fed have? Yeah, it, it is. It is a really interesting um, emerging policy area, and I think a lot of it is, comes down to fundamental ignorance. Like it's it's relatively new, and the D.C. policy apparatus and bureaucratic machinery just 
is not quite fully up to speed on all the sort of future developments here. But I think it's also predicated on the fact that like the legacy development of those stable coins was mainly to help, you know, Chinese evade capital controls. Like that's, you know, like that's what it was for, right? But and th so that that was where I, I don't know if that's what it was for. It was because well, people wanted started. to trade cryptocurrencies and couldn't get dollars onto the platform, so they made yeah, a dollar so token. Yeah, so you don't have. I mean, yeah. I mean, most most state jurisdictions give you on ramps and off ramps, except for China. Like very hard to get. But not in twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen. There were there weren't really on and off ramps. Not to trade cryptocurrencies. I mean, you could go buy Bitcoin at Coinbase and then transfer it over to one of these crypto exchanges, but there was no dollars yeah. on them, right? No, I, I mean, this is why like, dollar-based stable coins were a great invention, right? right? Like, right. They, they met a market need. Um, right. I wasn't saying it was a good or bad thing. I'm just saying, like, there's a large amount of liquidity that was pent, that was trapped. Right. Um, and this was, like, you know, like, relatively the easiest way to get access to these markets. Um, and so that's how it incubated. But a lot of, like, so this is where the U.S. government's kind of approach to dollar-based stable coins, I think, is going through a little bit of a transformation where originally it was, like, one of suspicion. Because all the people inside the government that had, like, been tapped with, like, the cryptocurrency portfolio were all from like law enforcement and intelligence community. And it was all through the lens of sanctions evasion or going after dark web markets, you know, so like their mental model was all our bad guys are doing bad things with this thing. Therefore, this thing is bad. Right. And I think only recently has there been like a growing recognition of actually there's a lot more good people doing good things with this thing right. than the bad people doing bad things with this thing. And so maybe you should reappraise like your net evaluation of the moral valence of this thing. <laughs> right. Uh, and I think that uh, from a geopolitical perspective, the, 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 the argument for the positive effects of dollar-based stablecoins helping to dollarize parts of the world that are very under-dollarized now is, and help you know, essentially spread the sort of the geopolitical influence of the dollar, you know, that's, that's coming on the backs of, of dollar-based stablecoins, right? And if you really, the opposition that's interesting to draw is between China's ambitions with the digital yuan they want to try to bring in more of the global south and their geoeconomic kind of trade um, uh, partners into a technology um, system that they are designing from the ground up, right? So it's the Huawei uh, routers, the ZTE surveillance systems, and you get the digital currency controls as well. And these are cross-bridged kind of CBDCs. This is kind of like the part of the Zoltan Th Posner thesis about China's strategy with the CBDCs is to create um, a dollar clearing, or sorry, a non-dollar clearing and settlement system that doesn't try to replicate the offshore um, kind of correspondent banking system that took 100 years for the U.S. to create, but is a sort of central bank to central bank and then critical state banks with each other and that are using essentially the same um, APIs that China is developing for their digital yuan to allow like atomic settlement of their currencies and their trade over this network that doesn't go through New York at all. This is the uh, BIS uh, Project Inbridge. Project Enbridge is, is one like, kind of really paradigm example of this, is where you have you know, central banks essentially be the key, key nodes in a, in a CBDC um, architecture that doesn't need to go through private capital markets. You don't need to have an offshore system develop liquidity. You just have the central bank be the market maker for every uh, for, for trade finance, for, 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 for all forms. It's that, sort of like uh, in the U.S., the Internet grew fast because we had wired phone lines, and mm -hmm. so the Internet grew over the wired phone lines. And then you saw mm -hmm. Africa kind of leapfrog past that directly to wireless. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people say the dollar can't lose its position because of the deep capital markets, because the, because the correspondent banks, you mm -hmm. know, the SWIFT system, et cetera. But this is like just bypassing that whole thing and then starting a whole new system, sort of like a leapfrog moment. Yeah, I mean, the Chinese strategy over like many different domains is kind of a um, block, build, expand, right? First, they want to block the ability of, say, a competing system like the you know, the dollar system to coerce them. So they want to be more resistant. They want to be more resilient. Then they want to build an alternative. Again, but building it doesn't mean it's ready to fully deploy. And that's what they're in the stage right now is they're trying to build these alternative systems as like a backup plan. But their long-term ambition is to expand them, to now move more liquidity, more settlement, to those rails. Um, and it's kind of a nonlinear process, right? It's, it's hard to get network effects until they're there. It's like, you know, Zuckerberg with the threads, right? Like, you can imagine, like, many other, like, uh, social media um, uh, kind of co competitors to Twitter just didn't have the social graph. So it's very hard to bootstrap a network. Right. Uh, you might say the same argument for China. China. China doesn't have the same depth of liquidity that the US dollar system has in foreign exchange, yada, yada. But guess what they do have is a different graph. They have the trade relationships. They have the political relationships. Right. And so their strategy, just like Zuckerberg, is like we have the Instagram network. We can sort of bootstrap a social, a social network with the Instagram network. China's strategy, we're going to bootstrap our CBDC network with our trade network. Um, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, right? No one knows, right, until you try it. But I think it's premature to, to count it out.
yeah, as, a, sure. as, as, a, as a legitimate threat. Um, and then that's at the, like the, uh, the state level. What's interesting about the Bitcoin dollar-based stablecoin interplay is this is sort of the bottom up, right? The, the citizens in those, in those countries in the global south, like they don't want the digital yuan or the digital naira, right? Like they don't want to just, you know, uh, offload their sovereignty to a corrupt government, right? That's and they've been vocal right? about that in Nigeria too. Yeah. Why yeah. would we take the naira? It's the same thing as the regular naira. It loses exactly. value. And and yet, like, what, like the U.S. U.S. Like, if we were like, oh no, sign up to our surveilled CBDC. Like, what's the actual, you know, compelling uh, sort of value proposition, <laughs> right? Whereas if it's like, hey. The U.S. government's actually in favor of Bitcoin dollar-based stablecoins. Um, that's a much more attractive proposition to a lot of these countries in the emerging markets. And it just so also happens to be aligned with our value system, which is, hey, we're not going to control it. We're not going to control you. We're going to let yeah. you do what you want to do with your money and help you like live a better life and you know not be um, expropriated by some corrupt central government. Like, yeah, that's and really have that dollar important. token as a bearer instrument, like like cash is supposed to be, and you could mm -hmm. rapidly expand. It seems to, to your point in line with. Uh, uh, original founding American ideals. I don't know if it uh, fits the uh, expanding uh, the potential future. Yeah, yeah the, the future ideals. Um, switch, switching gears a little bit, um, I wanted to talk to you. I know we're kind of running out of time here. I want to talk to you about one more topic, and this one maybe fits a little bit more into your, your wheelhouse. Hmm. And that's about uh, cybersecurity and potentially hmm. the threats of a cyber pandemic. And so what we've seen is, of course, uh, continued increasing rhetoric about the the pending cyber pandemic it's coming you know Klaus Schwab the WEF they pushed this and it seems to be really picking up steam Whitney Webb has done a lot of research into this uh, and even just recently we saw um, well both uh, the WHO wants to control all health for the world the US wants to lay down a sovereignty in that manner they say under a health emergency we can control everything including uh, the internet communications etc um, now there's a resolution hasn't been uh, signed but a resolution to now allow the UN to take over the power of the United States in case of any emergency. And they defined emergencies as numerous things, including currency crisis, including uh, uh, information or data crisis would be an emergency that would give them power. So we see, we see this happening. I, I think it was uh, Klaus Schwab maybe said, you know, we will have a cyber pandemic in the next 24 months. Uh, or two years or whatever it was before 2024. So what's your take on that? I know that's maybe a little bit more in your wheelhouse. Um, do you see that increasing rhetoric? Do you think there's something coming? Do you think this could be used as just another way to kind of move us into whatever system they want, digital ID system, et cetera? Well, I mean, Klaus Schwab is not like a cyber expert. I think they put on these Davos panels and they sort of pick the topic du jour and they like they're trying to draw attention to themselves, so they create some fantastical scenario and it gets everyone in a tizzy. Um, and the term cyber pandemic is like like not a technical term in yeah. like the cybersecurity field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and so it's it's a bit of um it's you know it's a bit of a I don't know like uh, but I, I guess. The, the final point is like our global systems are fundamentally digital systems and our modern life relies on these systems to function. Right. And like most code is just bad code. And if you want to do bad things and you're relatively capable, you can figure out how to like, m you know, do bad things with most digital systems. Um, and this is like, like a year or two ago, there was that big hack that mm -hmm. was it solar winds or um... yes. I mean, every every year we get one of these big ones. So SolarWinds was a classic supply chain attack where the, the Russians um, uh, SVR introduced like a vulnerability into a software update that went into like hundreds and hundreds of different companies yeah. as like, you know, critical software to like everything. Including the U.S. Treasury, I think, right? Oh, yeah, it went. It was it was a huge mess. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, this is a this is a classic example of where. You know the the opacity of the private sector supply chains, like digital supply chains, creating software can create a, acute strategic vulnerabilities for for countries around the world. Like for example, like the NotPetya virus that took down uh, Maersk was an accident. It was actually meant meant to take down Ukraine um, power grid, and it just sort of got into the wild. And it was written in such a way that it compromised like a pretty general piece of industrial software. And Maersk, the global shipping um, entity, basically had almost all their servers worldwide. Correct. Except for just, one, just, just happened to get into the wild. Yeah, I mean, well, this, that's the, these things happen. Sort like. of, sort of like when you develop these weapons and tools, somehow they just could potentially get out there. Why do we develop like a I gain of function done, study? Like, what are we doing with done, that? Yeah, sometimes it's done intentionally, but oftentimes it's just, just you know, fundamentally these are like leaky systems. Like, sure. and they're oftentimes the the effectiveness of the weapon is designed like you want to get into one network, and its its function is to spread throughout that network. 
And so they're really good at spreading to get to the systems you actually want to hit. Right. But this, the, the, the malware maybe doesn't know the difference between like, that network and another network. And then once it gets there, it just goes worldwide. And so these are examples just where our systems are really vulnerable. Um, there's you know, like different threat actors. There's like financially motivated threat actors that are just trying to like, you know, extract ransom or, or ransoms. But those aren't necessarily going to take down. Or steal data or whatever. Yeah, they steal data. They blackmail you, whatever. It's like that's a whole business now. Like ransomware as a service is, like a, as a, is a major thing. Um, and sometimes they're essentially moonlighting, uh, you know, intelligence officers. They're just like deploying their skills for, for criminal groups to make more yeah. money. Um, or vice versa. It's like often the same. The real like strategic threats at the level of like you know um, you know a catastrophic event uh, is like would be mostly nation state motivated, right? And this would usually come in the context of like like a tense like war, like like U.S. China conflict over the South China Sea would likely have a cyber component. Um, I spent we spent a lot of time thinking about what that looks like, what that manifests. There's a huge amount of thought going into the deterrence. Um, uh, kind of concepts that play out in in cyber war, which are very different than other forms of kind of you know established military norms. Like what's what's appropriate when you're attacking critical infrastructure? What's a like a nuisance attack can quickly turn into a like strategic attack, and sure. it's often very hard to calibrate. Oh, I'm just going to take down you know one little piece of a train system here. But it turns out that actually spreads to all the trains in that entire northeast corridor, and now like, you know, the economy is collapsing because no one can travel, goods stop flowing, etc. Um, or one example, the Colonial Pipeline, right. critical, you know, pipeline for for uh, you know energy in the northeast, and it was actually you know an error supposedly. It was like someone just like you know left their that account. Figured. Uh, yeah, and, and it got ransomware, and it became like the National Security Council's meeting about this thing, right? Like this is where we are as a civilization, and you know, you can you can you can ascribe a lot of like paranoia to like, oh, someone's planning the big event that's going to take down everything. What actually scares me more is not that there's some secret you know entity that wants to you know spring spring load the the, the big event. It's just our systems are so fragile just by design that it doesn't take you know some big you know. Um, secret group to, to to take it down. It could just fall apart by itself, right? Like the systems we've created are just inherently fragile and vulnerable, and they're just constantly being duct taped together, right? A new zero day gets gets released into the wild, and everyone's rushing to patch this. A new supply chain attack that gets discovered that affects half the Fortune 500. Like this happens like every few months, yeah. and this is just the way of the world. And it's an increasing um, strategic challenges to the 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 you know our vulnerabilities, right? It's like the last point I'll say on this is like, you know, what this means in the context of say state competition is it like closes the, the virtual distance. And, you know, we are protected by Pacific and Atlantic oceans for invasion, but China can do a lot <laughs> with, you know, just their you know, extremely capable and vastly numerous uh, cyber army. Um, right. And they're they're very patient. They're very persistent, and they're investing huge amounts of resources. Not only just like steal actual property, you know, what they've done for for years, but to establish persistence in the advance of a potential military conflict. I mean, one big story was the Volt Typhoon, a group that was just, you know, um, you know, named by Microsoft, you know, getting into networks in the Navy throughout Guam, multiple critical infrastructure um, uh, uh, firms in the United States. You know, basically, in just in case there's a war and we need to flip off telecommunications systems, we need to shut down satellite communications, we want to flip off, um, you know, other aspects of critical infrastructure. Like, this is, a, this is a constant battle that's happening behind the scenes is the defense of critical infrastructure against nation state attacks. And it's, um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone just like flipped the lights off for no reason, right? Like, because if it's really catastrophic, it would be perceived potentially as. Um, up to and including, you know, like an act of war, if not yeah. um, strategic threat. So, so yeah, you mentioned that is, the U.S. is like, I'm sorry, China is like heavily right. investing into this area to build this kind of army. You mentioned uh, Russia yeah. with their bots, uh, um, so forth. Is the U.S. also heavily investing into this area? Oh yeah, I mean, this is this is the. I mean, space and cyber are the two um, domains of warfare that any modern state is investing like leaps and bounds to try to um, attain a strategic advantage. I mean. We probably have the most exquisite like technical capabilities to get into the most hard systems, but fundamentally it comes down to like numbers of people and trained um, hackers that can actually sit at a computer eight hours a day and they have yeah. a particular target. And China just has lots and lots of people. Like you know, there's anecdotes that 
you know, you might think you're a 50 or 100 person startup uh, with some cool aerospace defense technology, and you might think you're too small to be on the radar of Chinese hackers. China might have a dedicated team, five to eight guys, whose sole job it is is to like get inside your networks and live there. Um, um, and they just have enough people where they can do that. Um, you know, FBI director said it's roughly a 50 to one um, ratio of kind of offense to defense. We have our own cyber command that you know, does offensive cyber operations, what they call persistent engagement or hunt forward to get our own access into the Chinese systems, get access to the Russian systems, et cetera, to create a little bit of like a mutually assured destruction thing. It's like, well, if you hit me, I can hit you. Uh, it is a, yeah, and we saw a little bit of this with Ukraine, but it was, um, it was a, uh, it wasn't a full scale conflict, um, and it was really interesting in Ukraine, like the back to the techno industrial war, like Ukraine basically offloaded their entire government, which is right, you think about it, digital services and information, your citizens' data, passport information, tax data, you know, health payments, social security, everything it sits on sits on sits, sits on servers in some government building. They basically took all those and they put them into a Microsoft server run by, you know, on, on, on Microsoft Azure in data centers in, in England. So it's like this is an example where you can have like digital exile, right? Digital governments in exile yeah. being run, uh, you know, on private infrastructure. Um, and I think this is like a different way to think about warfare now is it's not just invading capital cities, but it's also competing over like, well, how does that system of government still run, right? If it's being run on data centers, if you blow up the data centers, maybe the government can't run. So it's like right. a strategic... It's a strategic defense maneuver to take the government servers and be able to move them out of the country and still have the government, you know, that government still deliver its functions, right? Yeah. Still collect tax payments, et cetera. So it's a fascinating kind of new dimension of warfare that we're seeing unfold. So uh, what an insightful, long, and uh, very scary conversation to kind of frame up the world. And, and it's easy to see this power structure. And this is something like Ray Dalio has talked about extensively, mm. you know, kind of the, the, the rising power uh, meeting to, mm. at, at you know, the time of uh, meeting the declining power. Uh, it's an age-old problem, right? The, the son mm. growing up and overcoming the dad or, or whatever it is, right? Uh, so, so we mm. see that. Um, and obviously we don't have a crystal ball, at least I don't have one, maybe you do, but um, I'm curious where you think, uh, you know, how you view this over the next couple of years, like uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe through the next five years or the, or, the, or, the, or the rest of this decade, you know. In my opinion, it seems like this continues to break apart, which leads to probably more supply chain disruptions, breakdowns, um, you know, tit for tats, et cetera, which probably um, leads to higher inflation, um, potentially, you know, less goods and services for us in certain sectors moving forward. Um, I don't know, but what's your, that, that's kind of how I'm reading this. How, mm. how do you read it over the next several years? Yeah, I think I think in terms of scenarios and like the two, like the biggest divergence in terms of possible scenarios is like, do we uh, avoid war with China or do we have war with China? It's like because those are kind of like those are very vastly different futures, right? If we have, do you think, do you think like, if we have war with, so, so let's say yeah. we have war with China. Yeah. Do you think it's really the te you know technological information cyber uh, financial war, or do you think there's a, a chance that we would go into a hot war? I mean, this I is where the branch of the, the branch of the yeah. scenario is like, you know, one scenario that's plausible is China thinks they can basically do a d crippling first strike to sort of take out all of our military forces and all of Taiwan's forces in like a matter of hours, have the have the Taiwanese sue for peace. And then basically think that U.S. doesn't have the political will to mobilize and fight our way back into the first island chain and, you know, kick them, kick them out of Taiwan. Yeah. That's like one scenario that maybe China's banking on where they, they engage in military conflict, but we just essentially give up. We just essentially retreat and there's a new re-architecting of the Pacific um, security uh, sort of structure. One is what we do fight and we win. And we get the hegemon gets a new lease on life. And China basically is probably, you know, knocked back for decades. Um, uh, so that's like the strategic stakes of if you actually get into conflict, it's who gets the decisive victory determines, you know, really the branching. of. But either of those outcomes probably leads to supply chains breaking down. Oh, yeah. I mean, in any scenario where there's missiles flying, I mean, the world system is going to break in some right. critical ways, right? Like the, the Fed is going to have to monetize t 10 more trillion dollars in sovereign debt. There's going to be probably price control. It'll be inflation, but it'll be price controls. There'll be capital controls. Um, it'll be, you know, a very different world world environment, right? In either that, outcome, but just getting to that event, that's what that means. Yeah, if you get into any sort of shooting, shooting war, whether it's, you know, Anything that basically breaks global supply chains is going to be immensely disruptive. You know, Unless China moved hard on Taiwan and the U.S. just basically rolled over and said, fine, let's just keep moving forward. 
Yeah, I mean, that's like the optimistic scenario where right. we just sort of give up Taiwan, but then we sort of, you know, reinforce our sort of quasi-nuclear, um, you know, uh, wink and a nod to Japan and South Korea, and then we sort of hold the line. Yeah. Now, a lot of people would say it's impossible to hold the line. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't know. I mean, you don't know until you get there. But that would be the optimistic scenario where actually, you know, TSMC still functions. We just have to pay, a t you know, additional tax essentially to the Chinese um, to get yeah. our chips. Uh, and things just become marginally more expensive and, you know, U.S. power isn't as dominant around the world. Um, that's like, so that's like where the China dominant question comes in is like, can we get through the next three to five years without that sort of acute conflict scenario? Even if we avoid that, then I still think you're in a world where just the structural factors of embedded growth obligations in the West, retiring boomers, um, the you know potential declining energy return on, on energy investment from you know legacy fossil fuels is going to be hard to sort of keep powering the growth that we need to service these embedded growth obligations. You're going to have to sort of you know start to transfer money from the boomers to the millennials, whether it's through you know the devaluation of their savings, the you know outright direction of capital, tax distribution, etc. So you're going to see some major political dynamics unfold in the next five or 10 years. They're just function of generational distributions of wealth, income inequality, energy issues, et cetera. I mean, so I think even then you're in for, um, you know, a pretty uh, like dynamic decade, right? This is gonna be the decade where a lot of these imbalances that have just sort of gestated in the global system for the past at least 40 years, 50 years have to be resolved. When whether you can, you know, stretch that resolution and rebalancing out like over many many years like if you can do the the 40s playbook of have a little bit of inflation right to the sort of devalue but then you before everything breaks you bring it back down then you do a little bit more it's kind of the you know like lynn alden has done that chart yeah. right you can yeah, play that out over 10 or 15 years and that's maybe a way you could play it maybe that's what you're seeing now right we did the first wave and maybe there's gonna be another wave maybe there's another wave after that and then you can you know stretch the pain out without having an acute crisis situation um yeah, I mean, I don't have that crystal ball. Um, but but, I mean, e but either way, this conflict is here. There's multiple ways it could play out. But almost regardless of how it plays out, it means uh, probably supply chains, uh, disruptions, uh, and more inflation and, met and more Fed monetary debasement. Yeah, I mean, there's always wild cards. So I always pay attention to like tail risks, right? There's always things that can be weird that you didn't anticipate. And, and so I'd always pay attention to like, Stuff can happen that's never well, Everything's possible. We have to think about what's probable, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Russia invasion, pandemic, you know, China war. These are like you might call like gray, like gray rhinos. Like they were yeah. possible, but they never thought they would happen like next year. And yeah. so you didn't necessarily bake it into your forecast. And then they happen. And then you've got to radically readjust um, your distribution of, of, of future scenarios now that, yeah. you know, you've taken a different branch of the timeline. Yeah. Wow. Well, there's a lot to think about. Uh, super insightful for me. I really appreciate that. Uh, man, what an amazing conversation. A little scary. A little scary, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I know, uh, I know you, you uh, work in the kind of the cybersecurity and policy uh, er area. We'll link mm -hmm. to all your stuff down below. Uh, definitely give Matt a follow. He is a wealth of information. Uh, so we'll link to that down below. Anything else you want to bring attention to or shout out or anything like that? No, I appreciate uh, you know having me on. I, these are these are all very tricky, complicated questions, and I'm just trying to get you know at least the best handle I can on them. And uh, yeah, thinking in public is, is what I do on Twitter. So yeah. <laughs> happy to engage. All right, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right, that's a wrap. Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation with Matt Pines. Uh, he is so smart, and boy, does he have some good insight into this. But of course. Nobody has a crystal ball. We're all looking at the information and we're drawing our own conclusions. These are the conclusions that we've drawn. I'd love to hear yours. Let me know in the comments down below what you think happens over the next three to five years or the rest of the decade. Let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, give me a thumbs down. That's okay. At least tell me why in the comments. Subscribe if you're not already. And please share this video with, you think, uh, with somebody that you think could benefit from this. All right, that's what we got. Thanks so much to your success.